All right, there we go. I didn't want to like clear my throat in the in the microphone. That's never a fun sign. Well, good morning. It's so great to see you guys here. Uh, I got some new faces this morning. I loving it. Um, and uh, those of you who are online, welcome. So great to have you here with us this morning. Um, just a few announcements for you. Um, this is just also to remind everyone, but also for those who are, who are new to the church, um, the little thing in front of you, the little QR code that's in front of you, uh, if you want to use your phone, you can scan that, and that will give you uh, the church like bulletin. It will take you to something called Uversion, and you can follow along there. That's where our notes are at. Um, also has a place where you can, you can give if you want to give uh, digitally that way. Um, our offering box is also in the back. Um, has a communication card, so you can communicate with us there. Um, and another little thing there, if you want to subscribe to Right Now Media, which is a free gift to you, um, you can sign up there as well. So that's the QR code in front of you. Uh, Bible journals, if you want one, we got a couple left. Um, there's two back there. If you want one, you, sh- you can take one if you want it. Uh, if you want to give five bucks to help offset the cost, you sure can. If not, you just take one. I'm totally fine with that as well. Um, a good way for you to take notes and kind of start developing maybe your own little like uh, Bible commentary if you want as we, as we go through here. It's kind of a fun little, little thing for you if you want to do that. Um, Blood Drive is coming up on May 11th for those of you who are interested in it. Um, John said he wanted to do it, but he can't get off work. So um, I don't know what to say about that. So I, I, I put him on the spot. Put him on the spot there, guys. He's probably giving me a nasty look right now. Is that my, is he? Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, last I checked, there were some, some spots available. Go to redcrossblood.org, uh, I think is what it is, and you can sign up and, and uh, give blood. It's a great opportunity, we, and I'm excited that they love coming here uh, for us. Um, the last one is uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow we're doing our Q&A. Uh, last I heard, Carl was coming up with some questions to stump Joey, so I'm really interested to see what those are. Um, so uh, tune in to find out what those are. It's going to be lots of fun. <laughs> Uh, but if you, um, uh, so normally we do Mondays with the prof, um, and Joey has gone over to talk about worldviews and the Trinity, um, but this time around, Joey just got done with an extremely tough uh, pretest for his, his doctorate program, and his brain's just mushy right now, and so we thought, hey, let's have Q&A time with him, you know? It doesn't require any prep time. Um, so uh, we're, we're looking forward to having that, that time tomorrow, tomorrow night. Um, if you need the Zoom link, let me know. I will give it to you um, so you can participate with that. Um, it's kind of a fun way to participate um, and learn some more things. Um, if you can, um, if you can text the question in early, I can give that number to you, or you can send an email to us, um, or you can just totally be on the spot and give Joey a question, and he can have this like deer in the headlights look like, oh boy, got to figure this out. But anyways, that's tomorrow night. should be lots of fun. I'm looking forward to that, that time till we can, we can gather together. And thank you to those, this is to kind of follow up with an email we had this last week. Uh, thank you to those that donated money for uh, YFC to get Bibles. Um, it was completely funded. Um, it was funded uh, within, within minutes of, uh, of, of us, uh, the church, and Joey putting it out there um, needing funding. So um, I, it's, it's awesome. We bought, ended up buying 30 Bibles um, that will go between here and their other ministry up in Portland, and uh, it was just fantastic. So, and, and the other announcement is, because she's walking in now, is today is Kathy's birthday, so you can tell her happy birthday. Now she's not going to come in. Now she's giving me the look, like, why did I do that? Um, but happy birthday, Kathy. Yes. Don't worry, we won't, we won't sing to you. I, I, I won't have you come up on stage like I did last week with Grant. Um, but it's so great to have you guys here. So let's pray and then turn it over to the worship team. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. And it's just so great to be in your house. And it's so great just to, to worship you with um, other, other believers, other brothers and sisters. Lord, this morning as we prepare ourselves for the word, as we uh, prepare our hearts and spirit, um, Lord, that um, it would just be an amazing time this morning being in your presence as we start with, with worship, as we sing praises, as we give you devotion. I pray, Father, that this would be something that you just look down upon and just smile and so excited to see your children worshiping you this morning. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. 
You are not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid. You're not the only, we are all the same in need of mercy to be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, 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 and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter. Weak or strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And He so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us all. And all the people said, Amen. Oh, 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 and all the people said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for His love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another star. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said, Amen. Oh, 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 and all the people said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Oh, 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 and all the people said, Amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Amen. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing the islands of the sea. Echo back the ocean caves, thou shalt be her jubilee. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death and endless life, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing it softly through the gloom. When the heart for mercy craves, sing in triumph for the tomb. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves, this our song of victory. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. We're going to go to our family program this morning. And um, as always, I'm I um, invite you to come to the altar if you, if you need to, um, or obviously, obviously just use where you're at as the altar for your sound. But we're going to take a few moments just to kind of be quiet, and then I'm going to lead us through some things uh, this, this morning. So let's go to prayer.
Jesus, um, many of us come this morning with our minds swirling with many different things. We have maybe things related to our jobs, to our family, or even just to our, the things that are going on in our world. And it's just heavy and it's just upon us. And it is so wonderful to be able to come to a place where we can just air those things out before you, where we can know that you are listening and you are caring, you are taking care of these things even before we even express them to you. We're so thankful for the fact that you are in, in control. Even when it feels like the world is, is just spinning out of control and we don't have that control, that you are in control. But that still requires us at time, many times to put our trust and faith in you to rely on you, to pray to you, to have that communication with you. This morning, Lord, um, we just got a few things just to pray for for some of our own people here. Lord, about an hour ago, we got a phone call from, from Evelyn, and um, she was taking Charlotte into the ER this morning having some stomach problems and um, not knowing what's going on. Um, this is a constant problem that, that Charlotte's been having and the doctors can't really figure out what's, what's going on. But Jesus, I pray that um, you would guide the doctors this morning um, that are taking care of her in the ER to um, run the right test Father, they would uh, be able to pinpoint exactly what is, is going on inside of that, that young body. Lord, would you just be with Evelyn? Would you give her um, the patience and um, the wisdom that she needs to help care for her, her little one um, and also the, the other three that she has as well? You know, Lord, she's, just, she's exhausted um, and she's worried, but she knows that... Uh, the prayer is powerful. And um, Lord, we're agreeing with her this morning and praying for healing of Charlotte and um, wisdom for doctors this morning. So just be with them right now, Lord, as they're there. We also just want to pray for Gil Thayer. I see that she's here this morning. And um, my Lord, I'm so thankful that, that she's here. Um, Lord, I pray that you would Continue just to, to be with her as she's um, mourning the loss of her, of her friend, dear friend uh, Carl. Um, and God, I pray that um, you would just be near her and the rest of the family during this time. Um, and uh, Lord, just, just know, Lord, that she knows that, that, you, that you love her and you're caring for her amongst all of us. And God, we pray for, for Debbie, um, Anya, Lord, as uh, she has been... Um, uh, battling a, a kidney stone. And uh, I pray, Lord, that you would allow her body to, to pass that. And Lord, that it would be no complications for him. I know that there probably would be, but Lord, would you just give her the, 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 uh, the peace and the healing uh, from that as, as well, Jesus. And uh, we thank you, Father, for the fact that we can lift these, these different things up to you. We can be, as a family, we can be agreeing with one another and praying for one another during this, uh, these times of, of, of mourning, of times of sickness. And um, Lord, be with us this morning as we get into your word, as we process it, as we study it. I pray, Father, that we would be different because we had an encounter with you through the reading and proclaiming of your word this morning. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So can you think about a time that you got to share some exciting news with someone? Maybe it was 
around a, a job promotion that you got. Maybe it was being accepted into, into college. Maybe it was moving into your dream house. I saw a friend uh, on Facebook this morning. She, she got to get her first house, and she was so excited to share that with everyone. Um, maybe it's the fact that you're getting married. Um, maybe it's you're finishing your, your college papers finally. Um, having, a, having a baby. Like, we could continue on with this list, right? Like, we like to share good news with people. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. This morning, let's open up our Bibles to John 4, and we'll get to understand what I'm talking about when we're talking about sharing this good news, because this is what's happening in this passage this morning. And you, we'll see what, what goes on, and, and we may not get to, to that big part this morning, but Jesus ends up sharing some things, and, this, and then this person that he shares it with can't hold it in. They have to share this good news with other people. And that's the thing that, that we, as believers, we're called to do as well. We have this good news that, that we need to be sharing. If you have heard me for many weeks and months now, like I really encourage us, we have that good news. Go and share that with other people, right? Like we shouldn't be bottling this up and holding this in because it's so good, we need to share that with other people. So turn to your Bibles to John chapter four. Um, and it's really exciting. Congratulations that we have finally made it to chapter four. So thank you for, for being there with us as we trudge along. We're four months in, to, or five months now. Wow, I thought it was four. We're five months in, we're in the fourth chapter. But uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying, again, the, 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 the slow study of this, of John. And I'm, I'm really hoping that as we continue to move forward, that you'll continue to get that excitement and you will learn some new things about God's word as we move there and move through here. So let's read John 4. Um, we're going to read verses 1 through 26 this morning. Um, but like, I'm just going to warn you now that there's going to be a little, little spot in here that in this passage I'm not going to get to this week because we're saving that for next week. So we have a part two of this one again. Um, but that's because there's just so much that I can't, cover it all in one sermon. Um, but we'll, we'll get to it next week. But I'm going to read the, the big chunk of, of, of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and, um, and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went uh, back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, I, guys, I, I worked hard on that. Hopefully, I didn't butcher it too bad. Anyways, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus tried as he was, from, was tired from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone in town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and, and who it was that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and this well is deep. How can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who, gives, who, who gave, gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I will give, give them will become in them a spring of water walling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you, you have now is not your husband. What, what you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worship on this mountain, but the Jews claim that this place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father 
neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that Father seeks. God is spirit, and the worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Fun passage. It's a lot of good stuff here. And many of us know that this morning. Um, so this passage tells us right away, right away, that Jesus saves sinners. Okay? First thing, we get right away. Jesus saves sinners. No matter who you are, the greatest need you have can only be found in Jesus. You can only go, um, you can go to any college and you can find the most smartest person on campus with the most degrees that they have. And usually they say that's the smartest person that's there. And you will realize that the smartest person, they need Jesus. You can go to the most remote island in the world and find a tribesman who doesn't know how to read. And they, they need Jesus. Jesus died for both these the smartest person and the person who, who's on the most remote island who hasn't had the chance to, to learn how to read yet. No one is above or beyond Jesus. Those who know this truth are tasked greatly to proclaim the word to those that are around you. John 3 gives the account of Jesus with his interview with the, the Pharisee, Nicodemus, right? As a religious leader and as a very moral man he, that he was, he was, in doubt, uh, was no doubt shocked when Jesus said in verse 3, very truly I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus' religion was not sufficient. We looked at, at that at, at length the last few weeks. And then John 4 gives us the account of Jesus' encounter with this immoral Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Jesus was very skillful, um, skillfully shows her that she needs the living water that only that he can give. Now here's the thing, this is why I mentioned Nicodemus in, in this in, here in chapter four, because it's the same Basic message, but with a different metaphor here, okay? Let's look at that for a moment. Nicodemus and the unnamed Samaritan woman are as different as they could be. He was a Jew. She was a Samaritan woman. He was educated and orthodox in the Jewish faith. She was very, potentially, very, uh, was not educated and she was not orthodox. He was an influential leader. She was a nobody. He was from the upper middle class. She was from the lower class. He was morally upright. She was immoral. He sought out Jesus because he recognized his merits. She had no idea that the stranger at the well who was seeking her out was Jesus. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Jesus and the woman, they met at noon. Nicodemus responded slowly and rationally. She responded quickly and emotionally. But here's the thing. Jesus loved them both. He came to seek and to save all types of people. Jesus Christ is the Savior who, who can give the living water to all the thirsty sinners. And to drink of this living water of salvation, you need to acknowledge your need, confess your sins to God, and believe in Jesus for he who truly is, the Savior of the world. That only he can satisfy what our souls crave and what our souls need. 
One of the things that you see a lot in our culture right now, people, people are thirsty. They, they, they feed their souls with different things right now. One of the things I really loved about this, this worldview class that we've been doing with Joey is that we we're seeing the different ways that people are satisfying those needs. They fill those needs with other things because they have that need, that thirst. And truly, honestly, we know who can fill that need. That's Jesus. And before we get into the story of Jesus and Samaritan woman, John gives us a little bit more background information that really seems odd in the very front part of this passage. Like, okay, John, why did you add that? But it, it helps us out a little bit for context in some ways. Um, it also points out the fact to show that, that Jesus and John the Baptist weren't at odds with one another. They weren't in competing competition. That the Pharisees are watching Jesus very closely, um, and they have some concerns about what's happening here. John makes reference to the baptisms because it, it appears some of the reports that are being sent back to the Pharisees are saying that Jesus was baptizing people. And John, the, God, the apostle John here is saying, no, it wasn't Jesus. He, had, he was hands off. It was, it was us, the apostles who were doing it. All right. Um, nothing to our shattering these, in these verses, but more to kind of to set the stage, if you will, to make us kind of be aware early on in the gospel of this tension that's developing between Jesus and the Pharisees. Okay. Um, to be honest with you, I never really paid attention to that 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 early on, but we get that early on here um, in in chapter four that there's already starting to be this little divide that the Jesus and the Pharisees are having. So Jesus needed to leave Judea uh, because he was getting a little too much attention from the Pharisees. So Jesus' first Judean visit had come to an end and a visit begun by him going into Jerusalem at Passover time. And we talked about that a few a couple months ago when he went in to clear the temple. Um, you can see how his first Passover went while he was there. It went beautifully well. Um, and not gathering any attention at all from the Pharisees. So with all that attention, he needs to leave at this time um, because he knows that, that his time has not yet come for what his father wants him to do. So he needs to leave Jerusalem and go. So instead of going around Samaria, Jesus had to go through Samaria. Now, since the Samaritans were hated by the Jews, Many of the strict Jews traveling through Judea to Galilee took a route around Samaria. So you can see here on the, on the map here, typically they would, they would swing way out to the east of Jerusalem, go really way around Samaria, um, cut, cut across the rivers and to get up to, to Galilee. That's typically what we believe how the route they would take. Now, the best route, and we know from math and other things, that the short, shortest distance between two points is what? A straight line, right? So that's exactly what Jesus ends up doing. Takes a straight line um, right through Samaria. Um, but, uh, where everybody was going here with my notes here. Uh, but those who are traveling to make the best amount of time, they would go through Samaria to Galilee. The necessity in going to Samaria must be understood in a different way. That Jesus went to Samaria to give the Samaritans what he had to give, what he had already given to Nicodemus. The offer of eternal life. When it says in scripture that he needed to go to Samaria, this is why he needed to go. He needed to have that, conver he had that conversation with them about the eternal life by being born again. By going to Samaria and bringing the gospel to the despised Samaritans, he showed that he was above the Jewish prejudices. He was above it. He didn't care about that. He cared about people. Now, where did this prejudice come from? Samaria was a region between Judea and Galilee where the Jews of mixed blood lived. Okay, in the Old Testament days when the northern kingdom of Israel uh, had its capital in Samaria, when it fell to, this, to the Assyrians, many Jews were deported to Assyria. King Sargon of Assyria then repopulated the northern kingdom 
with um, captives from other lands to settle in that, in that area. And you can read about this account in 2 Kings um, chapter 17, uh, is where thou kind of hear about that. And these captives eventually intermarried uh, with a few of the Jews that remained in Israel at that time. And they formed a mixed race of people who became known as the Samaritans. And the Jews hated the Samaritans. And I, I use the word hated there. They hated them, okay? It was, a, it was not a pleasant, pleasant experience that they had with them. Uh, and the reason they hated them was because they were no longer of a pure line or a pure Jews anymore. Their blood was mixed with the Gentiles. The Jews who lived in the southern kingdom felt that these Jews had betrayed their people, betrayed their nation by intermarrying with these foreigners. And this hatred continued down through many years. And, and actually, really interesting, side note here, um, Anna and I had this conversation, like, are there Samaritans still around? Well, there really are. Um, there's, a, there's a very small group of them uh, from an article back in, I think it was like 2018, that said it, there's roughly about 800 Samaritans who can trace their lineage all the way down, and they still practice very strict um, religious rules um, in this little small town. Um, very fascinating, but this hatred is, is, is kind of like still kind of, kind of there. Um, anyways, um, the Samaritans um, had adopted the Pentateuch as their scriptures, and they set up a place of worship on the Mount of uh, Gizmiah. And this mountain is actually really interesting because it also is a mountain where Joshua sets up um, and divides the land for the people as well, for, for the different tribes before they enter the promised land. So uh, this mountain was, is very uh, prominent in, in Jewish and Samaritan religion. Uh, although they knew about a coming Messiah, they were far from having an accurate knowledge of the truth, and that's the Samaritans. Okay, so in essence, the Jews view the Samaritans as biological and religious half-breeds. And we need to fully understand the hatred for the Samaritans was real. And we need to understand what is happening here in the text, that it's extremely important during this, during this very difficult kind of history. And this is why it's important to understand what's happening here, why the Samaritan in, um, is responding the way that she is. And understand as we move through the rest of chapter four, why this is important. So to familiar yourself with where Jesus is, he's about 30 miles north of Jerusalem, roughly halfway between Jerusalem and Nazareth. And Jacob's well, which is mentioned here in this text, was about a half a mile outside of the village. Okay, so more context, kind of get to understand where things are being placed here. Now, the normal time for the woman to go and get water from the well was either early in the morning or, or later in the afternoon when the temperatures were a little bit cooler, right? Because remember, they are in the desert. And it's not fun to be outside to do extraneous work when it's hot out. So the woman would go to the well early in the morning or, um, or later in the afternoon when it was a little bit cooler, the well was a place where the women would gather to talk as they filled the water pots. So it was, you know, their version of the water cooler talk, you know, going on. Um, so they would, they would talk about what, how it's happening in the neighborhood, what's going on, you know, share the latest gossip in town, so on and so forth. Um, we can't say for sure why this woman came to the well at noon, but it may be that was because of her immoral life, that she wasn't liked by the other ladies of town. Right, and I am sure that some of you ladies could understand like what I'm talking about here. Like you just have this way of looking at someone, and you know right away that they don't like you, right? Um, and this woman had that same thing. She knew that she wasn't a liked person. So instead of like dealing, like instead of like having to deal with all the emotion and, and, and all the stuff that's happening, she just chose to go at a different time when there was no one that was there. But then she encounters a Jewish man who had the audacity to ask her for some water. 
Like so bizarre, right? Like Jesus is just like hanging at the well. I'm like, hey, um, can you give me some water? And she's like, you are a Jew. Why are you asking me for, for water? And the fact, here's the other crazy parts too, was that he was also a rabbi. Rabbis did not associate or even talk to women in public. The rabbis thought that even Jewish women should not be taught scripture. So far, Jesus has had many strikes here. He asked for water, which was shocking enough. And then he directs the conversation to spiritual matters, which even then was a big mind-blowing kind of thing, another no-no. And this woman was completely confused at what was going on here. What I love in this text with the Samaritan woman is that Jesus seeks sinners who aren't seeking him. Jesus seeks sinners who aren't seeking him. This woman was minding her own business. She was doing what she has done for who knows how long. Just coming to the well, get water, going back, you know, still doing all the things. And Jesus approaches her for some water and then turns the conversation into a spiritual one. She wasn't seeking to know God at all. Her guilt over her current live-in boyfriend and her five marriages, which had, eventually, had, had probably ended because of her multiple adulteries, caused her to keep her distance from God. The only explanation for the story is that Jesus was seeking a sinner who wasn't seeking him. Perhaps this is an example and an invitation to us in our own conversations as believers. I've been around accountability groups that have turned into nothing more than just airing out our dirty laundry with no remedy of pointing back to a gospel-centered um, life. I've seen prayer groups be used more as a gossip chain than anything. I've seen Bible studies that sought to make its members feel better about themselves than equipping them for, with the truth in their current condition. There is serious danger to believers who seek a remedy to their condition only in themselves. Jesus knew the Samaritan's sin and shame and wasn't afraid to speak frankly about her greatest need. In verse 10, Jesus mentions living water, which is a direct reference to life. It comes up a few other times in the Gospel of John. The woman was, was, was arrogant of God's gift, the gift of life represented by living water, and she did not know the giver, Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus makes an um, extraordinary offer to the stranger, living water that would quench her thirst forever. He says, I got it. I can help you with that thirst. I'm standing right before you. What's being illustrated here is that Jesus offers all sinners the gift of living water. Jesus is saying here in verse 10 and also in verse 14 that the living water that Jesus gives is a gift, not something that you must earn or qualify for. Here, I have pointed out here in John, um, in verses 10 through 14, I highlighted the different parts here. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water walling up into eternal life. So what is Jesus saying? That the gift of salvation, the gift of living water is given. It's not earned. Jesus gives it freely to those who seek him and request it. No sinner is excluded from the offer of this gift. According to many Jews and even Jesus' disciples, that Jesus should not have been talking to this Samaritan woman. 
And let's also throw one more thing in here. She was immoral as well. She had so many things against her, but Jesus confronted the sin and challenged her to be different. This is what the living water uh, does to you when you experience it. It changes you. It changes you. Have you ever been in a river and drifted off course because the current moved you in a different way? This is what's happening here. The living water that is Jesus will move you and change you. It will change your course in life and you now have a new bearing on life if you will, as you will. The woman has asked Jesus to give her this living water, even though she is thinking um, too much on a material level. If Jesus had led her uh, in, a, in a prayer to receive the living water at that point, she would have honestly probably been a false convert because something critical or crucial was missing in her life. This is an example of Jesus, the light that's shining in the darkness and exposing the evil deeds of this woman. Jesus shows her supernaturally how he knows all about her past and her present. He wasn't there to make her feel uh, better about herself, but to show her what she really needed. It would be a little more un a little unnerving to have a perfect stranger just come up to you and start laying out all your dirty laundry, all your past, present sins, right? Like, it would be crazy. But Jesus wasn't doing this to be mean. He did it to show her that her real need, her real need was spiritual. It was not material. He was trying to point to her, show her like, what I can give you is greater than anything you can find here on earth. He was helping her to come to terms with the nature of the gift that he was offering. See, when you go to a doctor and they give you a diagnosis, you don't fully understand it until maybe you experience some of the effects of it, right? Or maybe how its limitations affects you in some ways. It doesn't click with you until like, it, it hurts you in some way. It's possible, but not likely, that this woman's first five husbands had died. Jesus would not have needed to mention that since there was nothing wrong with the widow who was going to remarry. There's points in Scripture that point the fact that I was totally fine with that. Jesus could have simply pointed out on her current living boyfriend to zero in on the fact that there was sin. That's why he mentions it. Since divorce in that culture was actually not done just for incompatibility reasons, it's likely that this woman had been unfaithful in her previous husbands, which caused them to go into divorce. In her current situation, she hadn't bothered to make it official. Perhaps at this point, she didn't expect this one to last either. This also makes sense why she was just gathering water at noon by herself because everyone knew who this woman was. Now, before you can drink the living water of salvation, you have to acknowledge or confess to God that you're a sinner. And he knows that, of course. So there's no point in trying to hide it. But he wants you to admit it. See, my parents knew what I did before I even confessed what I did to them. Jesus didn't die on a cross just to give you some helpful um, hints to a happier life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. To come to him for salvation, you must realize that you are a guilty sinner. Like the particle son, you have to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. Granted, this woman did not explicitly confess her sin, to Jesus, but I think it may be implied in her droll reply in verse 19. Sir, I can see that you're a prophet. See, right there, she was admitting that his analysis of her life was accurate. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm taking two weeks to cover this portion of scripture on our topic because next week we'll talk about this idea of pure worship. 
But for now, there are a few things we can learn from this passage. First, how many times do we try to avoid people that are different from us? How many times do we walk the other way when we see a certain person coming our direction? I'll admit it. I've done it many times. I see a certain someone, I'm like, oh, I got to go this way real quick. We don't want to be bothered by someone because they may change our mood. They may drain us emotionally. But what if God is using you to speak life into them? I know that sometimes with certain people that they may be toxic and we need to create boundaries and that's perfect. That's, that's all well and good and we need that in our life. We need to create those things. I'm not saying like you just let this person continue to like beat you up every time they see you. But maybe they are also there for a reason. Then once we get the opportunity to talk with someone, how are you pointing them to live in water? How are you showing them that Jesus truly does care for them and wants the best for them? How are you helping the conversation? How are you moving the conversation into a spiritual one? Now, don't be worried if the conversation changes to something else. Now, listen here. You won't believe how many Jesus talks I have had over the years with middle school boys that moved from Jesus to girls to random body noises back to Jesus talking about video games. We could keep going on and on, Okay. It's amazing, though, that through these conversations, how randomly Jesus would come up in there, right? It's, it's amazing. But if we can, if, if we can be focused and, and pay attention to what they're saying, and then every once in a while, bring it back to a spiritual one. Look how Jesus did that with the water, right? He used the water as a way to like, talk about living water and how he can provide her with something that will never run out, See, when we are paying attention to scriptures, if we're paying attention to the person that's in front of us, we can steer that conversation to Jesus. We can steer that conversation to a spiritual one. As a parent, I love doing that with my kids. I love having a conversation with them, and then every once in a while, we throw in a little Jesus. And they weren't even ready for it. But, they, but it's, they're helping to see the fact that we need to be looking and pointing to Jesus. See, all you have to do is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And the Holy Spirit will prompt you. He will help guide you in those conversations. We also should not be in a hurry just to get somewhere. Jesus knew that he needed to be in Samaria. And we will see what happens soon because Jesus was not afraid to be with the Samaritans. He wasn't in a hurry to, to, to get to his next destination. He wasn't in a rush. He was, he was knew that I need to be here. I'm going to take care of these people. And we, we'll see later in chapter four what happens. God has you right where you are for a reason. Lean into that. Lean into the fact that God has you at that one neighborhood where you're at, at that one job, with those one people, those kids, whatever it is, God has you there for a reason. Listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Be praying for those that you can have an influence on. Those random conversations that you have at the coffee pot or as they come by your, your, your cubicle and you know that they're going to bug you. I had an office at, the, at my other church um, in this main hallway. I would turn the lights off sometimes because I, I heard certain voices because I knew that they were going to be draining me. You're in there? I, music was turned down, everything. But, I, but okay, confession. Um, but, but, be leaning into them. Be leaning into those conversations. God has you there for a reason. Be praying for how the church right 
uh, right where we're at, how we can have an influence on the community around us. Be praying for the Holy Spirit's um, presence would be here when people show up on this, on, this, on this campus, whether it's just to skateboard or to walk their dogs or whatever, like they would feel the Holy Spirit's presence and maybe we would have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Just like how you need physical water for physical life, you need living water for your day, for your dry and your parched spiritual life. Jesus is the living water that you need. And we can share that with others. Only he can satisfy our deepest needs and longings. There is nothing hidden from his knowledge. Will you come and receive this gift of living water as he invites you to? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful for the fact that In these first few chapters of John, you have given us so many different examples of what it looks like to be followers of you. And now we have a new one of what it looks like to to be in the presence of the living water. Right now, my, my mouth is dry, it needs water. But Lord, you provide that spiritual water that will quench our soul, that will provide for that, that dryness of our, of our spirit, what we're longing for. We don't need to be seeking any other thing in this world. When we devote ourselves, when we pour into, into you and what you're doing in our life, it's amazing, absolutely amazing to see how you provide that, that quenching of our, of our spiritual need. So this morning, Lord, maybe there are those that are here this morning that that need that again, that need that refreshing and need need to be reminded of that. I pray, Father, that they would would not leave here this morning until they get right with you, confess their sins and and want that living water back in them. And for those that may this morning, that may be the first time they've heard this and they need to hear that and they need that, that quenching of that dry and parched soul that only you can provide. They've seeking elsewhere in life and and realize that nothing in this world can satisfy them. And now they know what can satisfy that longing in their spirit, and that's you. I pray, Father, they wouldn't leave here this morning until they confess their sins and they invite you into their life and they become new. So, Lord, in this closing moments, if we sing this last song, that, Lord, we would maybe reflect on that, whether we, we're sitting, whether we're standing, whether it's coming up to taking communion, whatever it looks like of how we want to reflect on this message and reflecting on you being the living water. That this message would not just go in one ear out the other, but Lord, it would stick with us and we would act on it now this morning. Give us maybe names of people that we need to have conversations with this week. Amen. As I said, feel free to express how you receive this message this morning, whether it's still seated at, your, at the pew or you want to come up to the altar, you, want, you, need, you have communion up here, you can take communion. Respond to the message the way that the Holy Spirit is prompting you this morning. All right. Please stand. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see His wounds, His hands, His feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed. And drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. Yeah.
Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing your praise, O Lord. shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' only satisfies temporarily. It's delicious, but only satisfies temporarily. Jesus can satisfy us for eternity. Would you go in this week and share that with someone? Find an opportunity, allow the Holy Spirit to prompt you to share Christ's love with someone this week. Have a great week, and we'll see you next week.